anyway, another special thing happening this morning is Missions Sunday. Every once in a while, guys, we love to just hear from our missionaries. And one of my, one of my favorites <laughs> is here this morning. I should not say that out loud. But, um, and we have some special missionaries to our kiddos this morning. And I want to introduce them to you. So can you guys give them a warm welcome? John, I'm going to let you introduce your family this morning, okay? Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to, we are the Tilden family. I'm John, and I'm going to let my family introduce themselves real quick. I'm Juliana. It's good to be back here, and we just really appreciate your prayer and financial support. My name is Sophia. Maybe it's going to work and maybe not. Anyway, Corbin has a talker, as they call it, and that I think he's going to introduce himself. But Matea will say one more quick thing. I am six years old in first grade, and Corbin is nine years old in fourth grade. <laughs> All right, yeah, good. Well, his name is Corbin, and, and oh, well, we'll get it figured out, but... Okay. Hey, great to really, it's great to meet you guys. We're so thankful for the opportunity to be here to give you guys an update. Uh, continue to say, or to say that how much we appreciate your prayers and your financial support. Both are really needed. As far as kingdom things, as far as things, eternally significant things, it's not going to happen without the intercessory prayer. So please keep praying for us. Um, okay. So we think that one strategic way to reach people for who, um, uh, a people group, who live far, far away, is to reach the ones closest to us and help them reach their own friends and family who still live wherever they live, right? So if the Lord has called them here, and that's who we work with, we work with Muslims who have come to St. Louis, and if the, for those Muslims who have come to St. Louis, we want to reach them here and then help them reach their own friends and family who still live in Afghanistan or Bosnia or wherever they still live. Does that make sense? I know that was a little choppy and didn't, wasn't clear, but uh, hopefully that made sense. Okay, next slide. So when we th think of refugee ministry, this verse is something that we think of. John 10, 10, when Jesus says a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when you think about refugees, think about that. It wasn't their plan to move here. They had to move here because of uh, stealing and killing and destroying, right? And so when they come here, we want so much for them what Jesus gives to people, which is abundant life. Yeah, they have an opportunity for the American dream, but we're talking about the, the kind of life that only Jesus provides, or the relationship with him, with your sins forgiven, right? So these, this, this abundant life that Jesus gives, that's what we're wanting ultimately for them. And so if he's brought them here, if they're here, we want to reach them uh, with the gospel. So, okay, next slide. You remember the, uh, maybe from a few years ago this picture about the Bosnians and what they went through in the war in the mid-1990s. They were in a lot of... of uh, of uh, ref, uh, refugee camps, uh, and that was at the hands of folks who were referred to as Christians. They weren't following Christ when they were doing the bad things to them, though, right? So a lot of folks, Bosnians in St. Louis, were in refugee camps. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, and so a mosque in St. Louis, there's several of them, Bosnian mosque and several other mosques, but that's who we work with, Bosnians and other refugees, but uh, Muslims specifically. So next slide. This is a great family who uh, used to be Muslim, and uh, after years of uh, the Lord planting and watering, they come to the, came to the Lord a few years ago, and they've been really helpful for us in doing one thing that we do, which has helped start this. Um, uh, it's an online outreach called Putnade, which is a Bosnian for the way of hope, but it targets Bosnian spiritual seekers using Facebook ads, so they've been really helpful in that. So that's online, but the idea is face-to-face -face discipleship, right? So that's one of the things that's going on among the Bosnians. Uh, but we're not focused only on the Bosnians. We're kind of expanding to work with new refugees wherever they might come from. As long as they're Muslims, we want to be working with them, get to know them, and uh, share uh, Jesus with them. So next slide. Uh, during the pandemic, when it was even more difficult to meet people and get to know them, we started bringing food to refugees as a great way to get to know them. And uh, just talking with Matt earlier, that was, that's kind of an, an in to help them with their needs. And so that's, uh, that's uh, what's going on there in the picture with Matea. And that's a Speed the Light vehicle. Thank you so much for giving to Speed the Light. Uh, so you can see that that's a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Well, I'll tell you, it's wheelchair accessible. And so that has, I mean, that changes every day of our life is so much easier because of not having to put the chair apart 
every time we go somewhere and then bring it out and put it back together. You, you can imagine. Okay, next slide. Uh, baby showers, great way to continue the relationship with them. And so that's Matea and Juliana doing that with refugees, baby showers. Next slide. Afghanistan, man, things really turned in our ministry leading up to the end of our first term. We started feeling as the Lord saying, expand to refugees, new refugees, not just focusing on Bosnians. And then Afghani uh, Afghanistan crisis happened with the Taliban taking over. The timing was in that way, I guess, perfect for our ministry because we started working with Oasis International and Christian Friends of New Americans and all nations, started working with these organizations that reach new uh, refugees. And so next slide. And you can do this, too. All those programs have a, a way that people can uh, volunteer to uh, partner with them and get to know these new Americans. And so I would encourage you to talk to us about that if you wanted, like, once a month to go spend some time with a, a new, you know, Afghan family or something. But they're very hospitable, as you can just take a look at nuts and dried fruit and green tea and cookies and all that. And that's what it looks like to go in and just talk with them. So next slide. Uh, Christian friends of new Americans. We're the Christian friends. They're the new Americans. We work there with English, teaching them English, uh, conversational English, um, helping them get their driver's license. Like these are real practical things, needs that they have that we can meet. And so that's a great way to meet them, connect with them, get to know them. It takes time. So you're building relationship and trust. It's been fantastic. And uh, we do that. And man, it's been going so well. So the words that come to my mind are... Uh, open door. It's been an open door to give them a Bible. It's been an open door to pray with them, an open door to talk to them about the Lord. I mean, it's so easy. We're talking about so thousands of Afghans, right, who used to be in Afghanistan. I don't think we even have missionaries in Afghanistan because it's so dangerous right now, right? But now they're here, and we can reach them here, and that's what we're trying to do. And then we want to help them reach their own friends and family who are some of them still in Afghanistan, right? Does that make sense, the general thing there? Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's the ministry. Guys, thank you so I'm telling you, I promise you, it, it's going so well as far as an open door and being easy to give them a Bible, people who we couldn't even have access to, and now we have access to them, and that's happening. So anyway, just thank you very much. So church, let's stand to our feet. And John, did I hear you correctly that if we want to help with getting to know some Afghans or refugees that we can contact you. That's right. You can go through us if you'd like. You can go through us if you'd like, and we'll connect you with the organizations that have these, place, these things in place. But they want people to say, hey, I want to get to know a, a, a refugee. And that might be from Afghanistan. It could be from Syria or wherever. But that's available if you guys would like to. Great, great. So, church, and just... If you're new to Livestream Church, I want to also just tell you real quickly that as adults, we support our missionaries. But John and Juliana right now and Corbin and Matea are going to go over to our kids' area because when we get a missionary, we also give a missionary to our kids because our kids are going to get called to be missionaries. Our kids are called to be ministers and pastors, and so this is their chance. And so um, we're so thankful for John and Juliana being willing to go and spend some time with our kiddos. And if you have a kiddo in the youth group, the youth group raises money, and it's called Speed the Light. And they do. They support our missionaries with their vehicles that they need. And um, that vehicle may not be a car. It may be a boat. It may be a little airplane. So the youth have their thing, and the kiddos, they do uh, BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary Crusade. So we love missions. All right. But let's, let's put our hands forward, and let's pray for John and Juliana right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for John and Juliana's commitment, Lord, to be the hope to these people groups. Father, God, I pray that you would anoint their ministry. God, that you would give them creative avenues to give them that Bible, to give you your word. Father, to give them the hope of Jesus Christ, Lord, the light of the world. God, help them to be the salt, Lord, that does not lose its saltiness, Lord God. Help them, Lord Jesus, in their efforts. Bless them, Father God. Bless Corbin. Bless Matea, God, as they go to all so many churches and travel with their mom and dad. God, be a, a, um, be a blessing to them. God, now anoint them as they go and teach our kiddos. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good, good, good. I'm excited today to introduce to you our guest speaker, missionary Jamie Kemp, missionary to Indonesia. 
Uh, Jamie's got like a Chicagoland accent, and I loved hearing him say Indonesia because it just said a, cer a certain way. And so like for the rest of my life, every time I think about Indonesia, I hear it from his voice because he's been serving as a missionary to Indonesia for 14 years, and uh, we have had the amazing privilege of supporting him all that time. I think this is your third time to visit Livestream Church because we'd love to have you visit Livestream Church and share the word with us and also share what you're doing in ministry. And how many of you love it when we have a missionary that we've already met, we've already been supporting, they get to come and report. Amen? And so he's going to do that this morning. Would you welcome Jamie Kemp as he comes to bring the word today? <laughs> Two microphones. Yep, going to be a busy day. Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody here today, man. It is, uh, it's wonderful to be at a live stream, to be back here with you guys today. Uh, and so thank you again for this opportunity to be here. Let me set this thing up. All right, here we go. All right. Well, man, it's so great to be with you guys and to see what God is doing here and uh, just the growth and the new people that are, are, are coming to, to church here. What an honor. My wife and I are, are your missionaries to the country of Indonesia. And so thank you, uh, uh, Pastor Paul and Pastor Stephanie, for the opportunity to be here. I've, uh, I met them when I was 17 years old, all right? They were, uh, they were junior high pastors at the time. Um, I was a first-year university student, so junior high ministry. So if you think, you know, they spent time doing junior high high ministry, all right? So y'all, all y'all problems are easy compared to doing junior high ministry, all right? So, because if they can do, if you can do junior high ministry, you can do anything. That's what I always think. So, uh, so I was a 17-year-old freshman at university, and they were youth, uh, be doing junior high ministry, and they invited me in to, to be a small group leader, to be a part of their ministry. That was 28 years ago. Wow, that is crazy. All right, so, uh, uh, but man, it was so, it was so great to, to be able to serve under your leadership, and so I, I feel just really privileged to be uh, to be a branch of the investment uh, that you made in, in my life, a branch of your ministry. So thanks so much. 14 years ago, when my wife and I decided to, to move from suburban Chicago to uh, to Indonesia, um, man, Pastor Paul and Pastor Stephanie uh, and Lifestream Church were one of the first churches to believe in us, support us, and send us out. I think of that Bible verse in Philippians 1. It talks about um, uh, that it's the uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, missionary Paul, is writing to one of his supporting churches, and he says, "I give thanks to my God every time I think of you because you've been our partners in the gospel since the very beginning." And I think of Lifestream Church that way. That 14 years ago, uh, when we set out for Indonesia, this church has been our partners in the gospel from the very beginning. So thank you so much. We appreciate your church. We appreciate your pastors so much. Thank you for your faithful prayers and generous giving. Turn to the person next to you and say, Indonesia. All right, now most people don't even know where this country is, all right, if we're honest about it, all right? So uh, let me give you a quick geography lesson uh, so that you kind of know where we're located in the world, all right? If we've got uh, India right here and Australia here, India, Australia, the 17,000 islands, 17,000 islands between India and Australia, that's the country of Indonesia. Now turn to the person next to you and say, Indonesia, Indonesia, because now you know where it is. When you walked in, you were like, Indo, what? All right, but now you know where Indonesia is, all right? So that's the country my wife and I have been living there for the last 14 years as your missionaries there. But now here's the interesting thing about Indonesia. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. I mean, most of us know about the three biggest countries in the world, right? We know that China's the, the, the largest country, the most populous country in the world. Uh, India is the second biggest country in the world. The third largest country in the world is what? America. <laughs> All right, sorry. No, but the fourth largest country in the world, the fourth largest country in the world with over 250 million people living there is this island nation of Indonesia. So we've got all these people and all these islands, but most of us might not even know where this country was, all right? But, but here's the thing that's really, that's really captured our heart and our attention for Indonesia. It's this, that Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, with over 220 million Muslims living in Indonesia alone. So I mean, that's more than Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all those Middle Eastern countries combined. 
But we really believe that Indonesia will be the first Muslim-majority country to come to Christ. That's what we're giving our lives to, and that's what we're working towards. And one of the ways that's going to happen, one of the ways it's going to happen, is by reaching the next generation. So that's what we do. We work with Muslim university students, Muslim young people there in Indonesia. Now, now uh, uh, here, um, so uh, one of the things about Indonesia is, uh, is everyone we know is Muslim. A lot of times people say, man, Jimmy, what's it like living in Indonesia? And I'll say, well, everyone Everyone we know is Muslim. Let me explain that. Everyone we know is Muslim. Our, uh, our, our neighbors to the left, to the right, across the street, the, 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 everybody my kids go to school with, everyone we know is Muslim. Most of the time, we're the first Christians they've ever even met, all right? So it's always fun talking to them and saying, hey, what do you, what do you know about uh, Christianity? You know, what do you, what do you know about what I believe? And, and uh, they'll say, well, I know, you, I know you celebrate Christmas. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, tell me, what do you know about Christmas? And they'll say, well, I... I know you you bring your tree inside the house and I'm like okay I guess we do and and, and then they and then they'll, they'll they'll say well you put your socks above fire and 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 they'll say like is it Jesus's uh Jesus's cousin Santa Claus that comes and like brings you presents and I'm like no you know but uh but it gives you just an idea of how how unreached uh or how uh, how unreached or how lost parts of Indonesia really are oftentimes where the first Christians our friends have ever met there and so as we were praying and trying to think you know like how do you how do you reach a uh, uh, how do you, how, where do we start how do we how do we build a ministry a, a mission to reach out to to, to to the Muslim young people there in Indonesia because for the most part Indonesian young people Muslim young people are forbidden to even step into church all right so it's not like we can just invite them to come to us so so we were thinking uh, when we arrived there, like, how do we start? What do we build? What do we what do we do to engage a culture that won't come to church? And so we we talked and we prayed and we thought, well, let's let's open up an English center because I'm already fluent in English, right? You know, like like I speak English really good. No, all right. So some of you guys are like, yeah, that boy does speak good English. All right. So all right. Uh, so that's what we did. We opened up an English center, and and in 2014, we were able to open that English center, and, and it's been it's been incredible to see that that from there we were able to to uh, teach English, but then invite young people into Bible study, and we started with one small group, and then after a, uh, after a few months, we had several small groups going. Then those small groups turned into bigger groups, which turned into even bigger uh, groups, and then something uh, started happening where we started more and more groups. And, and, and a few years ago, we got permission from the Indonesian government to start our own church there in Indonesia, all right? And so this past Easter, we had over 150 people worshiping with us that weekend, all right? So, so God is doing something incredible there in Indonesia. And, and here's what the scriptures say about missions. This is what the scriptures say about missions in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says this. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all. Everybody say all. All, all right. They're with me. All right. That's good. All right. Most churches are like, what? What do you say? All right. So you guys are with me still. All right. So, so I've been given all, not some, not a lot, not most, not even, not even a whole lot. It says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Everybody say go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, this is going to be a key word for us later on, all right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have gi I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Wow, what a great promise for us. Now, this, this is commonly known as the Great Commission, all right? The Great Commission. But I like to think of it more as like the Great Commission. You know, like it's, it's Jesus and I doing this thing together. It's not like I just have to go and do this thing or fulfill this on my own. But, but, but Jesus is with me. He's empowering me by his, his Holy Spirit. It's Jesus and me doing this together. This is, this is the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations, right? Go make disciples of all nations. And it starts with this idea of going. It seems like whenever God speaks, he's always calling us into action, right? Whenever God speaks, he's always calling us into action. Go and make disciples. Believe and be baptized. Confess and repent. Honor your parents. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Serve your neighbor. Love your enemies. Forgive those who hurt you. The kingdom of God is action-oriented, right? The kingdom of God is action-oriented. I can remember 
in 2009, uh, uh, my, my family and I, uh, my, we moved from, sub, from Naperville, Illinois, from suburban Chicago to rural Indonesia, all right? I mean, talk about culture shock. Talk about a change of life. We, our daughter was just three months old at the time. And here we move from what's familiar, the suburbs, and, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a Muslim culture on the other side of the world. And we were, we were tasked with the responsibility to get to learn the language and learn the culture. Learn the language, learn the culture. And so I can remember uh, a lot of people would ask me, you know, uh, Pastor Jamie, how, when did you, uh, when did you uh, how long did it take to, to learn the language? And I like to tell people, well, I preached my first sermon after just six months of living there. I don't know if anybody understood the sermon, all right? But I preached it. I preached it anyway, all right? And, 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 but I can remember, so we took a full year to immerse ourselves in language and culture studies. And, and after that first year, we were asked to, to spend a semester teaching, one, uh, teaching at one of our Bible schools there in Indonesia. And we agreed to do, to do so. I thought it would be a great way to, to mentor some new pastors as well as uh, uh, practice my, my, my language skills. And so uh, we would have to drive two hours one way um, each week to teach a three-hour course. So two hours there, teach for three hours, and two hours to drive back. And I can remember those drives to and from the Bible school were some of the most powerful and heartbreaking times of prayer I've ever experienced you see, for two hours, we would drive through village after village after village and never see a single church. And I can just remember thinking like, like man, if you were born into that village, if you were being raised in that small town, man, there, you, you would go your whole life without seeing a church, meeting a Christian, or hearing about Jesus. And my heart would just break. I remember just crying and, and praying, saying, God, who's going to reach them? Who's going who's gonna to go and, and establish the church amongst these people? Who's, who's going to reach them? The people living in those villages have no opportunities to hear about Jesus. And this is why the Great Commission says, go. When we believe in Jesus and we trust him with our lives, he puts us into action. He, we are called to live on mission. And this is what missions is about, taking the gospel to where it's never been brought to before, the planting of the church where there is no church. And so today I want to ask you to consider giving your life to missions. That some of you, man, maybe you need to come and come out for a week to take a mission, a week-long missions trip. Maybe, maybe the Lord is stirring some young people or some, some couples or families in here to take that step of faith and, and come out for a year or two and, and consider praying about a lifetime. Because often I still think of those hundreds of villages. And I think to myself, this is the Great Commission. This is why Jesus says go. And God is still calling people to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Now, Berto is one of our disciples there in Indonesia. Berto is a great young man, and, and he grew up in a very religious context, but when he got to university, he, he, he kind of gave up on his religion. He gave up on his faith, because as, as, as a university student, he couldn't figure out how his faith really connected with his life, all right? And so, but as he graduated university, he got a job as a computer coder living in our city. And he kind of, as, a, as now as a young professional, he was trying to think, like, well, how can, how can I reconnect with a faith? I need to find out what I really do believe. And so as he was scrolling through youth, uh, through Instagram, he saw our church on Instagram. How about that, all right? And, and, and he saw that you could wear jeans to church, all right? That blew his mind, all right? And so he, uh, he I remember him direct messaging me, and he, uh, uh, and, and, and he says, uh, you know, Pastor Jamie, can, can I come to your church? And I was like, no. I said, I said, of course you can come to our church, right? You know, and so I invite him to come to our church, and I remember, this was uh, November of last year. I remember uh, uh, Berto coming in and meeting him, and super nice guy, great smile, as you can kind to see in the photo there, and I remember he kind of took his seat in the back right corner, kind of where he was just going to hang out, and as soon as service ended, he kind of, he slipped out and kind of went directly home, and, and so I followed up with him, invited him back to come the next week, he comes back the next Sunday, and I remember having some small talk with him again, and he kind of took his seat in the back, and as soon as service ended, he slipped out again, no no time to really connect with people, and, and this happened week after week after week, where he was, uh, he was just kind of a friendly young guy, kind of seeking truth, trying to figure out what he wanted to believe, and, and about mid-December, I get a text message from Berto. It says, Pastor Jamie, thanks so much for caring about me. 
following up with me, but I'm going to stop coming now. Um, I'm going to go a different direction with my life. And this just really moved me to prayer. I said, I said, uh, Berto, would you come back to church uh, next Sunday? Would you come and give God just one more chance? And he replied back, okay, Pastor Jamie, I'll come back and give God one more chance. How many of you know I was praying that week? <laughs> you know, you know, so I'm praying. I tell our leadership team about uh, Birdo's situation. So we're praying all weekend. I'll never forget, as he comes in that week, man, my faith and my heart, I was praying because I was like, man, I need God to have a breakthrough. And man, Berto needs God to have a breakthrough in his life as well. And so I'm praying all week. And I remember he takes a seat in the normal spot. And as service ends, I, I can remember him coming up the right side, the, the, the aisle to my right. And as he comes up, I can see there's tears in his eyes. And he kind of falls into my arm. And he says, Pastor Jamie, today Jesus changed my life. Today I've committed my life to following Jesus. And I was like, this is incredible, right? And, and, and I couldn't help but think about, uh, uh, about a situation like, like, like Berto, that like community can keep a person coming but it's the presence of God that changes a life, right? That community, man, we want to be in small groups. You need to be connected with other believers, but it's the presence of God that brings the change, that changes people's lives. And this is why prayer is so important. And one of the reasons why I'm here today is, man, I want to encourage you guys, I want to invite you guys to continue to pray for us, your missionaries, to join us in prayer, to stay connected, or, or, or to receive our updates, to, to know how you can pray. Because uh, uh, it, it, uh, there's no amount of creative programming that I can develop to reach someone like Berto. He's not saved because of my, my great preaching, right? Uh, he's saved because of the presence of the power of God at work. Well, Shortly after that, uh, it was about mid-January, um, I, I get a text message uh, from Berto, and he says, Pastor Jamie, I'm, I'm praying and reading my Bible just like you, you tell, tell me I should. And, and as I was reading the Bible, it says that, that I'm supposed to believe and be baptized. And I'm, uh, so he asked me, hey, uh, Pastor Jamie, can I, can I be baptized in water? And I was like, oh, I should have thought of that. You know, like I'm a pastor, right? You know? And so I was like, of course you can, right? That's great, right? Let's have a water baptism service, all right? And so we, uh, we get our believers together. We get our church together. And, and sure enough, just after, uh, we get them together. And I can never, I'll never forget that Sunday. That Sunday night as he comes up, up out of the waters of baptism, just seeing the tears come down his cheeks as he falls in my arms. And I thought, wow, a child of Islam has become a child of God. Amen? That's why the Bible says to go and make disciples of all nations. Go, make disciples of all nations. Now, the word for nations there in the, in the original biblical language is this word ethnos. Everybody say ethnos. That's where we get the English word ethnic or ethnic group, all right? So because ethne is the singular, ethnos is the plural. So we get this idea that ethnic group. So when Jesus says go and make disciples of all nations, what is more, it's, it's, it's much more specific than that. It's, it's, it's go and make disciples of all ethnic groups. And this makes sense to me as I've moved to Indonesia and I've discovered that there are over 360 different ethnic groups in Indonesia alone, all right? So it's not just, oh, oh, go and make disciples of all nations. Oh, Jamie's in Indonesia. Check that one off the list, all right? What's the next country we need to go to? No, it's much more specific. It's a, it's a, the call to missions is much sharper than that. It's go into all ethnic groups and make disciples. And in Indonesia, we have over 200 ethnic groups with 0% Christian. Over 200 ethnic groups where, where there are no Christians, there are no churches. If you're born into that ethnic group, if you're born into that part of the world, in that, that part of the nation, man, you'll go your whole life without meeting a Christian, hearing about Jesus, or, or see, I'm sorry, seeing a church, meeting a Christian, or hearing about Jesus. And are we okay with that? We okay with that? It's hard to believe in our day and age of technology and missions and research that there are still parts of our world that are totally unreached with the message of Jesus. So let's just take a second here and kind of talk about the difference between the lost and the unreached, right? The lost and the unreached. The lost are all around us, right? We all have friends and family members who don't know Jesus. 
And we all have a, our dance card, right? It's full of, of people that, that we work with, that we know, that, that, man, that we've, been, we've been called, we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach them for Jesus. Jesus loves the lost. Jesus died on the cross for the lost. But on my way to church today, I passed like seven churches, right? So there are, there are opportunities here to hear about Jesus. I mean, you and I are here, empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach the lost. So when I talk about the unreached, what I mean is this, that there is no opportunity to hear about Jesus. They are unreached, that there are no churches, there are no Christians, they'll go their whole life without ever hearing about Jesus. Now there's a reason why they're, they're unreached. They're hard to reach, right? Like, like if they were easy to reach, someone would have reached them already, right? You know, so like my, uh, um, like my parents loved to, to always ask, always ask me, like, Jamie, don't they, don't they need Jesus in like the Bahamas or like Jamaica? You know, like, and I'm like, yeah, that'd be great, right? Because my parents are like, we come visit you all the time, you know. But it seems like all the easy places are already taken, all right? So, so we're kind of left with just the hard places to go and make disciples. And, and um, so there's two main reasons why they're, they're unreached. Two main reasons. The first one is this, is that some places in our world are still very difficult to get to, like, like physically difficult to get to. Like uh, uh, a couple of years ago, Tasha, my wife, she led our, our team to, uh, to help plant a church in the Maluku Islands. But to get to that island that she went to, she had to leave from our island and fly eight hours to the island of Bur, um, to the island of Ambo. And when she landed in Ambo, she had to take an overnight ferry to the island of Buru. When she landed in Buru, she had to get off the ferry and get into a minibus and travel six hours to the interior of the island of Buru. When she got to the interior, they had to get out of the minibus and, and get into the back of a dump truck and drive two hours up the side of a volcano to get to a village where there are no Christians. It was the first time they'd ever heard about Jesus, all right? So sometimes they're unreached because they're just hard to get to, all right? Now, there was still another village two more hours up the volcano. We're letting another missionary take care of those guys, all right? So, uh, but, but, uh, but sometimes it's just tough. There's still parts of our world that are very difficult to get to. But the main reason why we have so many unreached people is this, is that, that there are still so many groups that are opposed to the gospel, that are resistant to the gospel. That in 2,000 years of, of, of church planting or missionary effort, there hasn't been enough sacrifice or, or there hasn't been enough success to see the church established amongst that people group. And, and one of those people groups is, uh, lives in the city of Palu. Palu, Indonesia is in uh, central Sulawesi. It's a, it's a city of, of a million people. No churches, no Christians. So we're not talking about, oh, this nice little village over here, we got to tell them about Jesus. Palu is a huge international city with, with international business and, and, and things like that. And, and, and there is no church, there are no Christians, there's no way to hear about Jesus in the city of Palu. So a couple of years ago, I, I, I met Pastor Ebbett, and Pastor Ebbett is a young pat, church planter who said, man, I've got a vision to plant the church in the city of Palu. And, and, and so uh, I was like, man, so let, how can we help you? What can we do? And so, so my team and I, we flew with Pastor Ebbett to the city of Palu, and we decided to do a vision and prayer trip. And so we were there in the city of Palu, September 28th, 2018, and we're there praying over the city and meeting some different Muslim seekers. And we planned a Bible study um, that evening at 6 p.m. PM, we're going to get picked up and meet some Muslim seekers to have a Bible study with them. So we spent the morning prayer walking, and we go back to the hotel. We kind of shower off. The city of Palu sits right on the equator, all right? So it's like, it's like crazy hot all day long. Actually, the word Palu in the Indonesian language translates hammer, and that's what the sun feels like. It's like the hammer hitting you all day long, all right? So we, we, we prayer walk in the morning. Um, that afternoon, we go, we shower off. We meet in the hotel lobby at 6 o'clock. And as we, we meet in the lobby, we walk out to the, the, the minivan out there. We get in the, the minivan. We pull left out of, the, out of the hotel. And all of a sudden, the car uh, is thrown, like, violently to the left, so hard that my head hits the, the, the side window of the, of the car. I thought, man, maybe we have a, a, a tire, our tire must have blown out. And then we're thrown to the right of the, uh, of the car. And I thought, well, maybe he's trying to like overcompensate. And then, uh, as I, and then we're thrown back to the left. And as I look out the window, I notice the buildings along the street begin to crumble and fall. And people start running out. And I realize, man, this isn't a flat tire. This, this is an earthquake, all right? 
And so I'm, I'm yelling at, uh, at Pastor Abbott, stop the car, stop the car. But he stopped like right under all these trees. So I was like, go, go, go. You know, and so, so I, I don't know what freaked him out more, me yelling at him or the earthquake. All right. But, you know, so finally we pull forward, we stop. And man, for 17 seconds, this earth, the most violent earthquake I've ever experienced uh, uh, happens there in, in Palu, Indonesia. And I can remember get, uh, as it stopped, texting my wife Tasha and being like, just experience the worst earthquake ever. Pray. That was the last time she'd hear from me for the next 10 hours, all right? So she had no idea what happened after that. So as, as, as we're looking around, we're seeing just total chaos, people running out, buildings crumbling all around us. Uh, uh, the city of uh, Palu sits right on the ocean, all right? And what's described as a geological phenomenon, a tsunami immediately begins to form. We begin to see not just the water recede, but we see just several hundred meters outside the coast, the white waves start to form. So we ditch the car, and me and about 10,000 of my new friends start fleeing to, to higher ground, right? We got to get out of here. And so, so, man, we're walking fast, we're running, we're just trying to ditch and everything to kind of, we don't know how big the tsunami is going to be, but we just know we got to get out of there. And so, so we're walking up the side of a volcano, and finally after about two hours as the sun sets, we get to a big open field, and there's like, man, there's got to be at least 10,000 people just camping out there overnight. And we decide, okay, we're going to have to just stay here overnight. We don't know how dangerous or how safe it would be to go back into the sea. So let's just hang out here for the night. When the sun comes up, we'll go in and we'll survey the damage and see if we can stay at the hotel or what we got to do next, all right? So we survive the night. We get up with the sun. We head back into the city. And, uh, and what we noticed when we finally got, made our way back to the hotel so we saw that the first floor of the hotel had collapsed down on the lobby, the same lobby that we were in at 6 p.m. that night. So the lobby collapsed down on the first floor. The tsunami had pushed cars and debris as high as three stories high up to the side of, of, of the hotel there, and, and where one-third of the hotel where my, my team was staying had collapsed down on itself. And I thought, wow, 6 p.m., we met in the lobby. 604 earthquake, 610 tsunami hit the hotel. Sometimes I'll say this to my, my, my friends. I'll say, hey, you know, during that whole uh, earthquake and tsunami there in Palu, uh, not a single church was destroyed and not a single Christian died. And a lot of my Christian friends are like, oh, praise God. You know, it's amazing how God protects his people. And then, then I'll tell them, well, that's because in the city of Palu, there are no churches to be destroyed. <laughs> And there are no Christians to have been killed. And that just shows you just how unreached parts of Indonesia and parts of our world really still are. And that's why Jesus says this idea of go make disciples of all nations. That, that because when we think of missions, at the most fundamental level, when we think of missions, the most fundamental thing we can do is what? Plant the church where there is no church. Go and preach the gospel where there are no Christians. That's the, the found, all these other things we do, um, helping the poor, serving, teaching, all these other things are great. We need to do them, but they're built upon what? This foundation level of go and preach the gospel. Go plant the church where there is no church. And sometimes I think of that earthquake and tsunami in, 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 in Palo, and I think, wow, this is, this is what we need to be about. All these other things are important, but the most basic thing is what? Go make disciples of all nations. And so when you give to missions, when you commit your resources and prayer to missions, there's something significant that is happening, whether you know it or not. Worship team, if you could come and help me close. All right. We worked on that all morning to have that smooth transition, all right? So I think we nailed it this service, all right? So when you give to missions, when you commit your resources and prayer to mission, there's something that's happening. Whether you know it or not, God is at work changing lives and changing nations. Your right now resources can have a forever impact. And I want us to understand that today uh, before we finish. To say, man, your right now resources can have a forever impact. Because if you don't give, we don't go. Or let, let me flip that around. It's because you give, we can go. It's because you do that. So I have to ask, you know, with your right now resources, 
What are you doing for missions? How are you impacting the world around you with your resources? Have you made a commitment to, to faith promises? to missions giving above and beyond your tithe. I'm not talking about your tithe or offering. I'm saying that I want to be in on what the Lord is doing all around the world. What are you doing to support the kingdom of God? That's why I say your right now resources can have a forever impact. What are you doing to plant the church where there is no church? Your giving supports our work amongst some of the most unreached. Well, the story of Palu doesn't end with an earthquake and tsunami or even our miraculous rescue from there. You see, Pastor Ebbett, he returned to Palu. And today, like literally today, there's over 50 new believers in his church just four years later, all right? And here's what's crazy. Last February, I had dinner with Pastor Ebbett in the city of Jakarta. And, and I was, he was sharing with me the testimony of what God is doing. And I'm like, man, this is incredible, Pastor Ebbett. Is there, is there something I can do to help? What can we do to, to, to help your church plant there in, in Palo? And he says, well, Pastor Jamie, two weeks ago, a drummer just got saved. Could, could you help us buy a drum set? And I was like, yes, you know, all right, let's do that. So, so man, your church, Livestream helped us buy a drum set for that church there in Palu. That's why I can say with full confidence, say, man, your right now resources are having a forever impact. Would you guys stand with me this morning as we close, or before Pastor uh, comes and closes us? Because the gospel says this, go make disciples of all nations. And sometimes when we hear that, we think, oh, missions is something that's, that's over there. Man, praise God for what, what, what's happening in, through, in, through Jamie there in Indonesia. Man, that's incredible. But, but really, missions begins right here. So missions is here. It's, it's there, but it's also right here. Missions is right here, right now. It begins in your home and with your family, and in your neighborhood, community, school, your workplace. Missions isn't something that just happens out there. The same, the same spirit that anoints me to do what I do is the same Holy Spirit that anoints and calls you to do what you do, to be a missionary right here, right now. Your community is waiting for you. Your, your, the people on your dance card are waiting for you to reach out and have an impact on their lives. Missions is there, but it's also right here. So this is what I want to do. I want to pray for you, that you would have that same sense of calling and that same fruitfulness that I feel and that I sense, that, that you would have that same anointing and confidence to walk as a missionary at your school, on, in your workplace, and with your family. So let's pray together this morning to receive that kind of anointing. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that, that, that man, what you're doing over there is just incredible, the way that you're, you're changing lives and bringing and, and, and establishing your church. But I also pray for my brothers and sisters right here, right now, that they would have that same calling, that same anointing, that same boldness to see friends and family members save the people that they've been praying for and witnessing to, that this semester, before Christmas, that they would see salvations happen, that they'd see the chair filled next to them with that person, that neighbor that they've been praying for. God, I pray for that special anointing, that special calling upon everyone here today that they would see salvation come to their family, their friends, their school, and their workplace, that you would bring life change to this community through the people here today. I pray a special blessing and anointing on them today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And everyone says together, amen, amen, Pastor Paul. Amen.